My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, says the Lord. So let us gather to worship and praise God's name. We welcome you to Fairfield Presbyterian Church's virtual service on August 16th. If you have any joys or concerns, please contact me as we turn our hearts and our minds for the worship of the Lord. Let us meditatively listen to Doogie's prayer loop. Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. God has forgiven us and drawn us close, reconciling us through Jesus Christ, who has lavished upon us the fullness of the blessed Holy Spirit. With glad and grateful hearts, let us praise the Lord. Let us affirm what we believe by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray the prayers of the people and conclude it with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. O oh God of abiding presence, you stoop to hear the murmuring of your people. You do not desert them in the midst of their fears. You see that they are continually fed and promise that they will always be led. You provide substance in the evening to sustain them through the night. With, when the dawn comes with the promise of abundance that will last throughout the day, we are your people, called by Christ to the banquet. You heap your mercies upon us and surround us with care. We thank you for how you watch over your children and seek to meet their every need. Through Christ, we inherit your promised deliverance and entrust our lives to you. Hear our prayers as we make our entreaties Feed us with the bread of life that Christ brings. Help us to arise refreshed with the dawn, ready to meet what awaits us. We pray for those who are hungry, O God, 
for those whom the lack of food is real. The wilderness exists in their stomachs. They murmur and long to be fed. Help us to share what we have in abundance, to be good stewards over what you place in our care. Keep us from greed that inhabits our obedience and give us compassion to respond to their needs. We pray for those whose quest is for righteousness, who thirst after the cup of new life. They would be nourished by the commands from heaven and be filled by your promised redemption. Help us to tell them the good news of the gospel, how Christ God died for their freedom. And we teach them what it means to obey you. Let them join with us in service. O oh God, keep us from taking your blessings for granted as though we are entitled to all you give. We have what surrounds us because of your grace. In Christ's name, we unceasingly praise you for your unending mercy and grace. We pray for the special needs of those whose names are now mentioned. We pray for Gail's and Jean, Mary and Ms, Grace, Phil, Anita, Nora Lou, Eric, Michelle, and for all those who wrestle with you for personal identity and spiritual peace. Let us now pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even though the church building remains closed for worship, the expenses continue. We thank you for your generous support of Fairfield Presbyterian Church. We ask that you continue to send your tithes and offerings to Post Office Box 834, Fairfield, Florida, 32634. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have given us more mercy than we could imagine and more blessings than we deserve. Receive now these gifts as tokens of our gratitude to you, that your mercy may be multiplied and your blessings abound to embrace all those in need. Amen. Let us listen reflectively to Doogie's musical interlude. Savior, your suffering has saved our lives, secured our future, and restored us to relationship with God. 
Remove the shame and fear that cause us to cower in your presence. By the power of your spirit, open our eyes and hearts to your word of love, mercy, healing, and blessing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our old scripture reading is from Genesis 45, verses 1 through 15. Let us hear the word of the Lord. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourself for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and re reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant of earth and to serve your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of this entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all of you. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother J Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen. And bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This ends our Old Testament reading from Genesis. Our epistle reading is from Romans chapter 11, verses 1 and 2a, and then skip to 29 through 32. Hear the word of the Lord. I ask them, did God reject his people? By no means. Paul said, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This ends our epistle reading from Romans. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew 15 verses 21 through 28. Hear the word of the Lord. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman 
from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, is it not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? Yes, it is, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, your great faith, your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My sermon title today is Where is Our Hope? As today's scriptures were read, you may have noticed that each spoke of hope at the end of Joseph's saga, he revealed himself to his surprised brothers. If you remember, Joseph's brothers had sold him into slavery to a caravan traveling to Egypt. Although his brothers had meant evil toward Joseph, their little brother, God meant good. In Romans 11, Paul affirms the ultimate triumph of God's grace, even for wayward Israel. In our gospel reading today, a Canaanite woman who has been given no hope for her daughter's recovery implores Jesus to heal her child, even though the woman and her daughter are outsiders. Jesus miraculously reaches out to them and heals the little girl. There is an abundance of grace and effusiveness of powerful compassion in Jesus. There is our hope. We live in anxious times. The current pandemic has us fearful. Many people are out of work and new jobs seem to be scarce. Everything seems to cost so much money, not just gas for our cars, but housing, food, the basic necessities for life, not just the luxuries, things that are added to life. The economy seems to be a mess. Maybe we have always lived in anxious times, and I just didn't notice, or I don't remember. The other day I was talking to a business person, and she said that she was also worried about the economy. She wondered what it would take to fix it. She said, people were scared. They were losing hope. We wonder about the future. What will tomorrow bring? Which brings us back to our scripture reading and our theme of hope. Let's look at the Canaanite woman and her problems. Wherein is our hope? In verse 22, the woman's cry, Lord, son of David, have pity on me is reminiscent of other cries heard in the gospel, such as when the disciples were tossed about in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. They pleaded, Lord, save us, we are perishing. In that instance, Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and sea and chided the disciples for their fear and their little faith. In another episode, Jesus tells Peter to come to him across the water, but seeing the wind Peter begins to be afraid and to sink, and he cries out, Lord, save me. Again, Jesus reaches out his hand and catches Peter and says, You of little faith, why did you doubt? Again, the disciples were unable to heal a boy who suffered from epilepsy when their father appealed to them. But Jesus healed the boy. When the father called out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son. Jesus tells the disciples that they were unable to heal the boy 
because of their little faith. Throughout the Gospel, Jesus immediately responds to anyone who cries out to him for mercy, salvation, or healing. Therefore, his initial silence towards the Canaanite woman is stunning. This is the only instance in the Gospel where Jesus ignores a person who approaches him in need. This foreign woman even used the Jewish title, Son of David, and calls Jesus Lord, and he still does not respond to her plea for help. I do not know about you, but I find this story disconcerting, and it makes me uncomfortable. This is one of the few times we see the human side of Jesus. We know Jesus is tired and wants to be alone, but this is Jesus. But for a second, Jesus gives in to his humanism. The disciples' response is no better, for they ask Jesus to get rid of the woman because she is bothering us. And she's nagging and persistent. They show no compassion for her or sensitivity to her needs. Is it possible to become so occupied with spiritual matters that we miss real need around us? This is especially likely if we are prejudiced against needy people or if they cause us inconvenience. I know a pastor at a large church who was so busy writing his sermon for Sunday that when a woman came asking for food assistance from their food pantry, he sent her away with nothing because he was unavailable to get her a bag of food from their pantry. Now mind you, this food had been donated for needy, but he was too busy with his sermon. I think there was something wrong with his priorities, and I'm sure you will agree with me. I don't know exactly what the disciples' problem was, but they definitely had one. Maybe they did not want Jesus to send her away, but rather to just give her what she wants so they can be in peace. One thing is evident, the woman was not to be put off. She was persistent in her appeal to Jesus. She truly believed that Jesus was the only one who could heal her daughter. That Jesus was the only one who could get rid of her daughter's demons that possessed her. There is something particularly scary when your child gets sick, so sick that he or she is taken to the hospital. Walk your way through any children's hospital and look at the concern on the parents' faces as their infant children or toddlers are hooked up to half the machines in the place or are being prepped for surgery. It touches your heart just to be in the same room with them. That's why the girl's mother was ready to try anything even religion, which is the way most of us work. Here the, has there ever been a time in your life when you would have tried anything to heal a loved one? When I lived in New Jersey, I had a neighbor, and he had a fi fiancé who had a very rare form of cancer. The doctors told them that there was no treatment for it, and she had only six months to live. He had heard about an experimental treatment for that specific cancer in Italy. They went and tried it. She lived a year. It did not work. But at least he tried everything he could, just like the girl's mother in our scripture, who was willing to try anything. But for us Christians and many other people, when all else fails, we turn to God. In this case, the woman had heard that a holy man was in town, one who had great power to overcome all kinds of problems. Since nothing else had worked, she figured 
She'd better risk even talking to this Jew, even though she basically despised Jews. Canaanites and Jews had had it in for each other for a very long time. Sort of like today's Palestinians hate Israels and Israelites and vice versa. Besides, what was he doing this far north? Just as there are certain neighborhoods in every American city you just don't go into day or night. So there were regions where Jews didn't travel into. So what was this man doing here? But the stories about this man were so remarkable, she figured it was at least worth a try. She stood there looking at him for a long time. There was something about him, the woman had to admit. She wondered, is he really the son of God? She thought, that's what they say. How simple and plain he seemed, just like us. Have you ever noticed how celebrities always seem taller until you see them in real life? I have met Ricardo Muti. He was once the director of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Guess what? He was down to earth, friendly, and really nice. The woman in our scriptures thought to herself, Jesus does look sturdy and strong, the signature of a life of a carpenter. And what a preacher he was. He could turn a phrase like no one you have ever heard, but not heavy with too much flowery or elegant speech. No, he was simple down to earth. His words cut straight and fast. His words had power, they say. He speaks with authority they say. Not even been to seminary, they say. Sure, knows scripture. Sure, knows God. Sure, knows people. But when she cried out to Jesus, he did not answer her, it says. Jesus did not say, answer a word. Of course, it's possible he didn't hear her at all. You know the way our loved ones and friends say that they can't hear us sometimes? when we know that they hear a lot more than we think. Truth be known, we all hear what we want to hear. And sometimes it seems like God doesn't hear us at all, which is not true. God does hear, but God does not always reply. In fact, sometimes God seems silent, that it seems like he's not there at all. But that's not the case. Jesus was silent many times in his life. He was silent before Herod. He was silent before Pilate. In fact, is that Jesus was probably silent more often than not. As a person who chooses his words very carefully, my guess is that Jesus unnerved people the way he looked at them with those penetrating eyes searching their heart and his own with all his silence. The silence of God unnerves us all. When we want help, we want it now. Why does God seem so silent? There are times in all our lives when we experience the absence of God. And finally, some of us just give up. Give up on God, each other, and life itself. We give up hope, but not the Canaanite woman who teaches us about faith and hope. In a way, she was becoming a pest, like the young woman in the John Wayne movie, where John Wayne plays the part of Rooster Cogburn, the broken down drunken marshal, the woman hires to stalk and kill her father's murderer. At first, Cogburn tries to ignore her, and then sends her away but there was no way to get rid of her. That's the way the Canaanite woman was. Even the disciples tried to send her away. The Canaanite woman is not only persistent, she is free of pretensions. She knows she is an outsider, a Gentile. Jesus was her only hope, and he is our only hope. She was not to be put off by anything just as we must not be deterred from Jesus. She was determined and relentless 
as we must be. Her faith won Jesus over. He healed her child. We too must have faith in Jesus Christ, wherein is our hope. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. My charge to you today is the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God has gifted you with forgiveness and graced you with reconciliation. Go now and share God's gifts with the distressed and estranged. Christ has called you close to him and healed you from torment. Go now and call others to receive God's mercy and healing. And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.